So welcome to the technical founders panel. Um, this tends to be my favorite talk or panel session of the whole conference. It's probably the least technical thing we do here because if you know, as you've noticed, there's lots of architectural diagrams and formulas and machine learning models and all that other good technical stuff at the conference all the rest of the time. This is the one session that we do that's, or that's aimed um, to be a little bit more business oriented and um, I'm a three time technical founder, a software engineer from the first bubble and so what I like to do in this panel is I, is I try and imagine me as a young founder, as an engineer and a young founder and what what did I want to know then that I don't know, that I didn't know, and how did I learn it? Um, and so when I talk to other technical people, um, it seems that they've often gone through similar, similar problems, maybe different solutions. Uh, I think the representative of the other technical people in the audience who might be interested in starting companies as well. So uh, this session is with you guys in mind, for those of you who are thinking about starting a company, who are starting a company trying to run it better, um, who are starting your second or your third company because your first and second company failed, um, which always happens, by the way, 90 plus percent of the time, so don't feel bad. Um, when I stopped and I realized how many companies I had started before the one succeeded, and then I realized it wasn't even the number of companies, it was all the ideas I had that I tried to get to market even before I counted them companies. And when I realized I had failed seven, eight times to try to build something and bring it to market, and only two or three of those had I even like, gotten to the point where I even called them companies, I realized how many failures I had under my belt that finally brought me to the point where I felt like I was competent as an engineer entrepreneur. So all that's a big long intro to say um, that's why we're here. So um, I hope you're in the right place. Does that resonate at all, guys? <laughs> so we're gonna talk about failing fast and failing often um, and we'll try and keep it lighthearted. <laughs> so I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, we have Elp, Hussein, and Will, who's also our data science track host. Um, and they're each going to tell us just a little bit about um, how they got here and briefly about the company that they're working on now. Please. Yeah, so my name is Elp. Uh, thanks for having me. This is a really nice uh, opportunity. Um, yeah, so I have a PhD in machine learning. And uh, afterwards, I set off to found this company called Faro Labs which builds uh, machine learning software for the industrial sector. So this is kind of the approach of taking a very kind of sexy, sexy technology and applying it to a very unsexy area. So imagine kind of any kind of manufacturing plant. Uh, they're typically sitting on a lot of data. We help them become more efficient with their own data so they can reduce their energy bills, they can improve their quality, they can reduce waste. And so this is kind of one kind of untapped area where we found that machine learning had a very kind of high value add proposition. I'm Hossein. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, uh, like Alp, I, I did my PhD in machine learning. Uh, I worked at Google for a couple of years. And then uh, I was a co-founder and chief data scientist at this personal financial management app. Uh, so after that, uh, we have started a new company, which is m more around uh, organizing blockchain data and making it available for uh, different use cases. Uh, we are a very early company, so. Uh, William Falcon, I'm co-founder of NextGenVest. We help high school students uh, figure out how to pay for college over text message, so we'll pair you up with a Money Mentor, which is like your financial advisor, and we'll figure it will help you apply for loans, uh, get you scholarships, even tell you where to go to school and so on. And before this, um, I was working at Goldman Sachs, uh, internal startup there called Marquee, and then I built about eight iOS apps before that. Some for my own, I guess those are failures. <laughs> and then the other ones for clients who hired me to build their companies. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm doing a PhD now in deep learning and reinforcement learning at NYU as well. Sometimes you um, fail by helping your clients fail, um, but that's <laughs> a different kind of transfer learning. Um, so we have PhD, PhD, and PhD. So first question, what business do PhDs have starting companies? <laughs> sure, I, I, I can take that. Um, I, I think it's a great skill set. Uh, I think uh, one thing you learn throughout the process of a PhD is to handle uncertainty. 
uh, you get very uh, adept at being able to teach yourself new concepts quite quickly and adapt to new information. And I, I think uh, you guys will agree that that's a skill set that's useful when you're testing so many hypotheses as an early stage company. Yeah, I guess I'm coming at it. Uh, you know, I did the company and then started my PhD. So I, the similarities that I'm noticing a lot are the kind of rapid iteration and the ability to, you know, to be able to succeed in your company, you have to test different hypotheses uh, very quickly and like fail fast or like dig into one and like really push through it if, if you like think it's gonna work. And you also, you always have like viable options of things you could do, but one of them uh, is probably gonna take too much effort and not give you enough RI, so you have to kind of balance those things out. Um, so the research mindset is very much like hold a lot of things constant, change one thing, see what happens and do that, and that you kind of need that as well for your startup. Uh, I think, in general, intellectual depth, if you manage not to let it get in your way, is good. Um, so, uh, basically, I mean, uh, running and operating a business 95 or maybe even more uh, percent of the times is just finding, searching things, finding them out. But then they are like 1 or 2 percent or maybe a little bit more, depending on the type of company that you would need to kind of get deeper and kind of try to like understand intellectually what's going on to be able to navigate out of it. And, but uh, even though it's a small percentage, it al always happens because there's so many decisions that uh, you end up making. So it helps. But uh, identifying that where, where are those like couple of percentage that you need to, you know, use that depth versus just being ag agile and uh, executing is, is, I think. And on the money side, you have fellowships, you have grants, things you have to apply for, and that's very similar to fundraising. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, good point. Um, so, I mean, obviously there's all types of um, educations and life experience and professional experience um, that, you know, not everyone has a PhD, and um, I don't think necessarily the message is you have to have a PhD to start a company, but, um, but it's very interesting that the iteration and the experimentation sort of resonates with you immediately. Um, you, are there other, just speaking about the academia thing, are there other categories of academics that you see um, challenged in starting companies or were, were, were there particular things in your experience that you had to sort of relearn or learn differently where coming from academia was, a, was more of a challenge than, a, than an asset? I'll take this, I think. Uh, we tend to seek perfection as academics, uh, right? We want to polish our ideas. Uh, you know, look at any kind of uh, opposition we might have to the ideas that we're presenting. Uh, so when we present scientific ideas, it comes from this kind of defensive skepticism kind of perspective. And I think there simply isn't that room to do that in a startup, right? Things cannot be published, uh, it, things cannot be polished uh -huh. from the get-go, you don't have that luxury. So I think that's maybe one thing. Yeah, it's actually a great point. Uh, we had this issue early on where a lot of uh, my employees would like want to, to present something very polished, and we had to say, you know what, like just get us a V1 of this because I, we can't wait three months for the for you to like come up with the like the thing that you're like proud to show. It's like it's okay, like no one's going to judge you. Um, so having that ability to present something that's not 100% done is very critical. Yeah, that's a great point, and I, I saw that in my early days um, as an engineer turned founder, like I just was a perfectionist and I wanted everything to be perfect. And just the concept of like showing the world your app in draft mode just seemed asinine to me. And that was probably one of the earliest things that I had to break in myself was just my own need for perfection, perfectionism. And um, I think we, we learned that through other transfer concepts like MVPs, right? And the, the startup culture is okaying that we can launch stuff without it being perfect. But sometimes it's easy to be said in an acronym, but it's hard to actually internalize. So I think that's a key thing. Um, what, what were the other challenges? Uh, and this might be more um, you know, related to other areas, but what were, what were your greatest challenges personally in starting your first company? Um, or starting your last company? Just any sort of specific story that was a real hurdle that you personally had to overcome? Shall I take this again? Uh, sure. I, I think um, there's a lot outside of academia that is governed by um, kind of what I might imagine as like, or describe as soft um, 
effects. So when you're fundraising, you need to convince people to take a bet on your company. Uh, oftentimes, the things that you might rely on uh, to evaluate other you know, things that are very concrete and technical won't really fly there, right? Some investors will simply just want softer signals. Um, and that's kind of hard to get your head around because you know, we typically operate with this method is better than this other method because it minimizes this number. And that's self-evident. Exactly. And or therefore, think we think it's self-evident. Exactly. So therefore, this is better, right? Like, you know, we should bag trees because it's clearly the better thing to do. Um, I think that's a bit frustrating. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 I, I see the same challenge, basically, and we're kind of taking the academic side a little bit. Uh, you have a lot of ways to be objective about concepts. But while uh, in the business world, even if you find good mentors that they had a lot of experience, it's really hard to find objective ways to think about. Everybody has their own biases, their own excitements, uh, and you kind of need to understand those subjectivities and uh, kind of find the objective way to you know, be a successful business. And sometimes with numbers, that's more clear, but sometimes someone just asks you, I think you need to, you, your go-to-market should look like this. Man, there's uh, no clear evidence why or why not. So, uh, yeah. So I think there are a billion challenges, right? Um, and, and at different scales as well. So you know, if you're an engineer coming into a startup, you have your own like brand of challenges that you have to overcome in terms of communication, uh, sales, like different skills that you're going to have to develop, especially if you're going to be a founder. And on the other personal side, you know, most people are likely, if you're not coming from school, you're probably coming from a job that's probably paying you fairly well and you have a pretty good life. So having to take a huge pay cut and then have to change your lifestyle and then uh, kind of swallow that and then be, be okay. And, but like, you know, you have, to, you have to really, it comes down to like self-belief, I guess. Like you have to believe in yourself enough that you're willing to take that financial risk, that you're able to convince other people to work for you, to work with you, you're gonna convince founders, sorry, uh, investors to invest in you. So it's really, if you don't have that confidence, uh, it's not going to work. <laughs> and when, when, it, when things get really hard and all your friends are out there making money and whatever, and you're making, I don't know, 50, 60K a year, whatever you wanna pay yourself, uh, it's gonna really, really try you. So you have to, have to believe that you're gonna succeed. Otherwise, you're like 98% for sure gonna fail. <laughs> so what if, what if you're like me and you just say, screw it, I don't have any social skills, I don't wanna sell anything to any investors, I'm gonna do this all myself the hard way. Did any of you bootstrap and not raise money, or did you end up raising money? Uh, we bootstrapped for maybe a year or so. And, and what was the pros and cons of that? Um, I think hiring is, is the first thing. So it's, it's always, almost always just a founder team when you're bootstrapping. Um, if you can convince anyone else to, to help you during that phase, they're doing it either on the side or part time or whatnot. So once you raise or you have at least some revenue coming in such that you can grow the team, then the dynamics immediately change and also what you can do changes. I would say it depends really to the business you're thinking about. Just experience from B2C, uh, bootstrapping is gonna be tough. Uh, you, you just generally, the way you approach B2C is you burn some marketing money and then you have, you iterate, you pivot, uh, and that's necessary. Uh, so, uh, and that's m maybe a reason if you want to bootstrap, you, you don't want to kind of be out there uh, looking for money, thinking B2B, it's like building a product, you can walk into your customer, they will tell you why they don't want it, if they don't want it, and then you can iterate and bootstrap, and that's a, a kind of much more viable idea. Yeah, I, I, again, I I'm, I'm was a little bit playing the devil's advocate because um, you know, clearly you have to learn how to sell something at some point in time, there's no question. Um, and uh, you know, that, that's, just, that's just reality. Um, how did you find, Maybe instead of talking about how you found your first investment, because that's a big sort of nut to crack, um, and sometimes it takes several tries before you get that right. Um, how did you find your first customers? Like, what did that look like? Because oftentimes it can be easier to find customers before you find money, since the money wants you to presume that you have the customers or wants to see them first anyway, in many cases. How, how did that look for you guys? Um, so for in my case, my co-founder was working on our company a bit before I joined her, and it was really kind of experimenting with those ideas. 
And uh, I mean, she took a few different approaches to basically going into schools and trying to speak to people face to face, right? So doing customer discovery. And then once we kicked it off into high gear, then we literally had people on the ground that we were paying to go. So um, yeah, I mean, going into high schools and acquiring new users, so. So that was a, like a massive ground game, just like glad handing, talking to people, meeting them IRL. Yeah, exactly. Going to where they're at, right. literally. Cool. <laughs> I think in both of the uh, efforts that I had, I was the customer. I kind of started thinking about, I need this, uh, and I just I was out there doing it. And then I thought, well, if there are more people like me needing this, and there's a team that we can build and deliver on it, then and when you are your own customer, you have a lot more understanding. Of course, you have also biases. If you are not the typical customer, then you're building it for like a, a small niche, but. Uh, it, it gives you a very good understanding of what are the needs. Yeah, it also removes the need for you to feel like you're selling, too. This is the Y Combinator trick, right? Um, don't worry about how big the itch is you're scratching. Just make sure it's your itch. Because if it's your itch, you understand the ins and outs of it, you, you're passionate about solving it, you quickly like, get into conversations where, even as an engineer, you don't feel like you're selling, because you're just talking about how you solved your itch. And so it's a really natural way um, for us to overcome our own sales and marketing challenges is to make sure that you're focusing on a pain and a problem that you really have instead of picking one from the grab bag of things that you think somebody would invest in. It also helps with hiring or like getting your co-founders. If, if they have the same problem, they would just buy it. You don't even need to explain why. Yeah, cool. Um, so, do you all have co-founders, or did you decide to go it alone? What does that look like? Yeah, I have uh, co-founders. Uh, I think it helps a lot, especially if it's your first time starting a company, having that sounding board, uh, being able to kind of discuss ideas, iterate quickly. Yeah, I found it to be a huge positive. Yeah, it's a lonely world, so co-founders, uh, for sure. At least your first company. After that, you probably have a a bunch of advisors, some people you can rely on as well. Uh, so that's a other tr trick no one tells you. Founders usually have like a whole staff of advisors to help you. Like I'm not a professional, when I started I wasn't a professional CTO, but then I hired a few CTOs as advisors and they help out, right? So um, this also goes to your question earlier. What's an, I guess something you, um, as a technical founder, what would you do? I, uh, to like avoid selling and all this, like I would just hire a CEO. <laughs> like go, or get a co-founder who is, who is like the perfect, salesperson, like MBA type, all that, who like really wants to own that because once you go fundraise, once you go uh, do partnerships and everything else, like someone will have to own that. Uh, so you, like you don't have to be the person to do it. Yeah, good, good point. Um, our keynote this morning, Baron Schwartz, um, he's the co-founder, I think the founder actually of Vivid Cortex. He had no co-founder that I know of, um, but he was able to step aside at some point and find a CEO to help grow the business because, you know, he. I think made himself do it early on, but then really wanted to get to the point where he was able to scale in a different way, and so that helps. Um, yeah, sometimes you have to try and solve your own problems, but sometimes you just need other people to help. Um, I wanna dig into the mentorship thing, because that was key for me as well. Um, did you build an advisory board? Did you find your friends with MBAs to like, give you advice? Like, What forms did that take early on? For me, I mean, my, you know, my philosophy, I guess, you know, to try to boil it down to like a simple sentence and question is like, who are the best people in the world at something? Because I'm not at those things and I want to find that person and then hire them as my advisor, right? And a lot, a lot of times that's equity, you give them equity. Um, and you know, if um, you have to sell them on your idea as well, but if they're passionate, they will help you out. But you know, uh, if you want to really kill it at marketing, go hire, go look at, I don't know, some Google or Facebook, whatever, find the people who are really doing well there and try to get them to be your advisors on that, on that side. Yeah, that was probably the first time I learned to sell anybody my idea, because I couldn't sell it to a customer and I couldn't sell it to a VC, but I sold it to uh, what, who became a friend from Intel who was building a similar product like inside that company. And when he saw how passionate I was about the thing, he agreed to help me. And I, this was before I could raise money. But I, made, I, I sold a friend, essentially, and I got him to back me. And he was in my deck, and he was part of my advisory board. And that was a very, very small start to finding that kind, like learning that I could passionately sell that idea. Yeah, and they'll bring relationships, so that, that, that's another good point. So the, 
it's kind of like a chicken and the egg problem. So you crack it by bringing the advisors. They give you more legitimacy. Then you go use that to raise money. <laughs> I think another uh, uh, thing that happens with early stage investors is that they often recognize the need for this advice as well. Um, so our lead investors for our seed round, Bowery Capital, almost exclusively works with technical founders. And to complement that, they have uh, staff members who help with sales and marketing and HR, which are typically things that technical founders have not done before. Um, so you can also find that kind of advice built into the startup ecosystem through investors or through these kind of informal uh, advisors that you can go seek out. Yeah, it's the best way to get great people work with you because it's, uh, it's just designed that way and a lot of people I have never found someone I randomly reached out on LinkedIn that I have questions I would like to talk to you about something to say no so I mean sometimes they don't read the messages so that's different but uh, and some of those people that they start kind of understanding or they start uh, helping you to you know grow your idea more and better it's very natural to engage them and incentivize them so definitely advisors yeah, excellent. Um, LinkedIn is an amazing tool, and uh, as much as cold outreach, you know, scares those of us who are technical, it can be a powerful, powerful thing when you see people start to respond to your messages and actually start to offer you help. It's quite remarkable. Yeah, and that's if if you know that now before you go start a company, if you're working somewhere, like take your managers, get them to like you now, so that when you leave, they can still be there for you. So my MD at Goldman is still one of my advisors right now, and like he can open up a lot of doors, right? And so wherever you go work, definitely make that network because they will facilitate things for you later. Yeah, excellent, excellent points. Um, so let's shift a little bit more to the data side, since this is a data conference after all. Um, you're working in manufacturing. You're doing blockchain analytics, and you were doing um, conversational AI, all that stuff uh, for uh, for uh, high school students with yeah. money, money management, right? Yeah. So, what's like? W were there key ways that you thought about the data aspect of your product? Was that meaningful to you when you were building your first things, or was that was that an accessory or a benefit of being successful? Like, how did you? How do you think about that? I guess I can start. I mean, it's, it was a big kind of hypothesis for us because the manufacturing space is largely closed to us kind of regular people, right? Like we just take for granted that there is steel available to manufacture all of these things and there is wood available to manufacture everything else and you know, there's energy, you know, all these things we take for granted. Um, so the question is what do these establishments look like and how much data do they have um, and what does that data look like? So for us, it was kind of a critical hypothesis that we went, went around investigating different sectors and see, you know, looking for evidence. And uh, there is indeed a large variation of data readiness across different sectors, and that's something that was part of our kind of discovery process. But you probably realized as well that they didn't even have the data set that you wanted to build for them. So your product, are you putting sensors, sensors on machines? We are not. No. We are not. Well, so, so what's your approach? So the assumption is that uh, there are sectors that are already a bit more data ready. So they already have sensors installed, or the equipment that they use to manufacture whatever they're manufacturing comes with sensors. And so they're already sitting on data. There's a whole other segment of startups that are working on, let's go into these sectors that are a little bit more behind the curve and sell them hardware so that they can become this kind of like Internet of Things equipped, you know, next generation factory. So the opportunity for you is to help the, the client um, use, utilize the data that they had in more efficient ways. That's right. Got so it. that was our kind of proposition. That's what we explored. Got it. Hussein? Uh, well, we are, we are a data company. So, but uh, to kind of, uh, as a general. What, what does that mean? So we, we package and provide data. So data is our product. So uh, just as a general uh, comment and around like why I ended up and doing what we are doing. Um, if you're a data scientist or data engineer, you have data-related skills, there, there are basically two, there's one way to monetize that, and that's like to apply it to some data. So now, either that data is owned by a company which has other operations, other processes that is generating that data, and then you need to go work for them or like be a consultant from outside, or you find the data that's out there, it's public, 
and uh, not many people have looked into it. And you package it, you find some insights from it, and you sell the data. So I've gone the, sec the second pass after like my experience with other uh, businesses. So. Uh, and I think as data scientists you want to, or data engineer you want to see where the data is, who owns it, and what is the potential value coming out of it. And is it kind of looked into a lot or not many people have really digged into it? Uh, for us, from the beginning, I was definitely probably more opinionated about this than, than Kelly, my co-founder. I wanted to build everything that we did on machine learning, right, in the future. So, you know, we're thinking if you're going to build a new bank, like, if we can start from the ground up, how do we do it? And can we set it up right now to be correct so that as we scale, we have all the tools there? So I hate cleaning data. So everything that we did from like day one was just to make sure that everything that we took in was structured and designed in a way that would make data science and machine learning a lot easier. And to this day, it's still that way. And so every single, we have analytics and metrics and everything is in real time because of that. Um, but you know, for a lot of our models, the, the neural network specifically, uh, which are doing a lot of the conversational stuff, it takes a lot of data to, to train those models. So we didn't have that data for like a year. Uh, so during that year, we basically spent our time locking down our business metrics so that we can track our OKRs and make sure that we're on track and business health and all that. So that's all generated as meta, metadata from your operations. And I think even if you're going to do a machine learning company, you need to have that first because you, like this is a research site where like you need to know how you're driving the business before you can make any decisions about it and see the impact of that. And, and so what about, so Will, you got to the point where you guys were generating your own novel data set that was the byproduct of your, yeah, your product, having, is that fair? We're having chats, so people are texting us and at some point we had enough conversations and enough text messages to where we could do our own, right? But even in machine learning, even if you're doing neural network, uh, even deep learning, you know, you can do transfer learning. So if you're doing computer vision, um, I guess application, you can always use pre-trained models. Now for NLP, as of like a few weeks ago, there's this crazy model that you can use transfer learning on. Uh, so there, there are new techniques where you can take other data sets and then fine tune them in yours, and now you have a re really great model. Um, so. so is that emerging as a meaningful um, like answer to the cold start problem? Yeah. Yep. And startups can get super creative about doing these things, but I think transfer learning is the way to kind of crack that apple for AI companies. It's like how all the autonomous vehicle companies in Silicon Valley were training their early models on GTA 3. Yeah. I mean, this is a thing, like it happened until they got enough data where they could, right. you know, not play inside the video game anymore. Yeah, and that's, you know, self-driving cars, like that's how they're doing a lot of that. You can't, you can't go crash a thousand cars just to figure out that you shouldn't turn left there. So you, you, you build simulators and you do it there. So is this, um, is this concept, is this philosophically like changing the ball game for small startups that don't have access to all the training data of Google, Microsoft, or Amazon? Or is, is that still, does that still represent sort of an existential problem for small startups who need to train stuff? I guess it depends on the domain, but I think that small startups right now can compete with Google and Facebook because most of the AI is open source anyways. All the papers are public. So the data set, you know, I don't think AI companies are competing on the AI itself. They're competing on the data set now. That's your moat, and that's what you should protect. But there is enough data and open source stuff that you can bootstrap something, jumpstart it, and then collect your own data. Um, yeah, and you know, you're, I guess you have less restrictions on like a Google and Facebook where all the attention's on them, like Cambridge Analytica and all this other stuff, right? So you just have a little bit more flexibility. <laughs> what do you think, Hussein? Uh, well, as a startup, I mean, there's always that fear that big companies uh, uh, are not good for you, but uh, I think there's a gap and there's clear, if, if you find a problem that you're solving as, as adding the value, uh, those platforms, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, uh, they are just, they have done a lot of work and they give you free, almost free products. So if, if in 90s or even early 2000s you wanted to build a company, you needed a server room and you needed some people just to keep that up for you, now you can go on Google Cloud and have that for free. They give you some free credit that you li literally have that server room uh, who would have costed you some uh, startup money. So, um, and they are not your competitors if you kind of look at, think about the problem you're solving, that their basic infrastructure are helping you and then you're adding the uh, 
maybe the intellectual uh, concepts on top of the problems you're solving or the operations or processes that they will never get into doing. So. Help any other thoughts on data novelty? Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's very specific. I think the, the thoughts that were raised are, are spot on. Um, in our case, th there is kind of no data available or there's no data sharing that happens. And so when we sell our software to different customers, there is nothing in there that we have learned from any other customer because we couldn't have gotten that first customer if that were the case. If they knew that we were taking their data and using that for you know, building software that we're gonna sell to their competitors or anything like that. So I think it's interesting that there is you know, a, a spectrum there. There's machine learning that, and AI that you kind of need this data to get off the ground. And then there is a whole other branch of machine learning that's kind of based on domain expertise and you know, strong models and kind of, you know, you know, Bayesian techniques that work well without having seen data. And that actually can be applied in these situations when you have no access to data, which is what we're in. Yeah, great point. There's a continuum, right? There's, there's unstructured public data. There's semi-structured data. There's structured private data, which can sometimes be shared across customers in the right use cases, right? There's all kinds of different options. It reminds me of that company Checker in San Francisco that started to offer background check service as an API to onboard Uber and Lyft drivers who wanted to sign up fast and Uber had to, they had to have a third party validate the background checks. Well, all this data has been available publicly forever, but the companies that were managing it were so screwed up that they couldn't turn around results fast enough. So Checker just got access to all this public data, structured it better, stuck it in an API and became this super fast growing company on the backs of Uber and Lyft. And they just found public data sets that were out there and were better about updating it, keeping it current, structuring it, and turning around like requests in their API calls. And that was the business. But it's a public data set. So there's, there's lots of opportunities in data that don't necessarily, I mean, I think if you're a, 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 on the other hand, if you're a company that's a Twitter and you're generating your own immensely valuable novel data set that's sort of the byproduct of consumer success. But that's not every data company either. That's only a few in the world. So I think there's a lots of sea of opportunities in between, which it seems like you guys would agree with. Um, what's the problem with uh, AI for everything? Like if I want to go start Pete.ai tomorrow, what's the problem with that approach? So I see AI as a way to solve a problem, I guess. I don't want to use it as like, oh, I have this fancy tool. Let me go find a problem for it. <laughs> so I, I see. The opportunities, you know, maybe that's a, like, if you want to publish and, you know, develop new algorithms, maybe that's academic. Like, yeah, you could just do that because you don't necessarily care about an application, per se. It's like maybe the novelty of it. But if you're trying to create a company, you need to produce value for someone. So uh, you, you really should just be looking at the problem. And if you can solve it using machine learning better and more efficiently, then that's a tool you can use. But I wouldn't go the other way, I guess. I think it even uh, hurts us at times. So there, there, there's so much hype around AI and, and, and what AI can do and what the next revolution is going to be in all these different fields that uh, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, customers can have very different understandings of what's actually possible now and what might be possible you know, five, 10 years down the road. So I've, I've seen both sides of that coin. So there's two bums in San Francisco and they're talking in the street. And one says, hey, I started an AI company yesterday. And the other one says, AI company, why? And the first bum says, valuation. <laughs> Hype, yeah. Don't all laugh at once. Uh, think about your questions, by the way, because I'm clearly getting tired of asking questions. So uh, we're gonna go to the audience in just a minute. You wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, so uh, on the AI company, so when I, say, when, I, when I say AI, I guess what I'm more talking about because maybe it's more my research, but deep learning, reinforcement learning, those kind of techniques, right? And like a lot of Bayesian uh, networks and Bayesian deep learning as well. So everything's getting mixed up in there. Um, and for, I think th there are interesting new, like when a new technology comes out, it opens up new opportunities. Before deep learning and reinforcement learning, we weren't great at modeling raw signals, like images or sound or text, like directly. And now, for example, with deep learning, you can take raw sound waves and literally translate that into someone speaking or another answer or text, where that was really hard to do before. And like, we weren't great at it. We could do 
a decent job, but not amazing at it. Now with these new techniques, it opens up a whole new opportunity. So automating call centers, uh, I don't know, text-to-speech, uh, the, the thing that Google did a few months ago, right? So, so many new opportunities that just weren't feasible before because we now can understand these um, inputs a lot, a, a lot better. Are we, are we doing deep learning well on the, on the mobile yet? Um, is that TensorFlow port, is that working well, or where are we at on that? Yeah, I think a lot of your phones are running some sort of neural network. <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely. Well, today, the uh, point around AI, yes, there is hype. Uh, yes, there is evaluation concepts. But uh, it shouldn't stop you from thinking, uh, what is the te technology frontier and why AI is hyped? Yes, it is hyped, but let's just think about it. And uh, of course, there is the marketing, the whole AI as used as a trademark. Uh, uh, but then there is science of it. There are two different concepts. but it's. Uh, it's interesting to see how AI also, uh, practical AI has evolved. I think in 70s, people at MIT who were trying to build AI, they ended up building PCs. So uh, and if you think about it, it is intelligence it's for you to like, type something and something happens that would have needed more of you know, human intelligence and work to like, work with. Uh, computers before that. So uh, everything we do that makes that interface uh, easier is some sort of AI. So as long as there's an understanding and we know we are solving a problem, uh, I think it's fine. It just needs to be doing it. So. Um, Excellent. There, there's one final thing on, on the, I guess, model selection part of it. So something that I see a lot is you know, and, you know, you see some finance, and that makes sense. But I think in the data science world, uh, I, there's this kind of aversion to deep learning, like neural networks, mainly because they're finicky to train and everything. And that makes sense for a lot of things. But it's also sometimes you have to pick the right tools for the right job. And a lot of times, neural networks are not the best job, the, the best tool for something. But sometimes they are, and people still don't want to use them when they are the best tool. So, like, um, I remember there was uh, someone was talking about like. I think it, it was sound, um, and they were trying to use other types of methods. But the best state of the art right now is a neural network. So kind of not doing that basically kills a lot of time if you're doing a startup, for example. So trying to pick the right tool, but not over-optimize it, if that and makes sense. And what is that predisposition against deep learning? Like, where do you think that comes from? And may maybe it's kind of died down a bit, but it was, I think, around um, the, you know, the black box concept, so not being able to look inside the models. and. Uh, to some extent, that's still true today, but we have a lot more ways of explaining models, right? And, um, you know, there's, uh, there's Jan LeCun, who everyone, I'm sure, knows, um, and you know, he, has, he has a great phrase, which is like, you know, if you have like a random force that's giving like 40, 50% accuracy on your data set, and, I, and this is in a business application, and I give you a neural network that gives you 90%, even if you can't understand that, like, that's a lot of money <laughs> for you not to take that model, right? And so a lot of times people will kind of at that point, switch and say, yeah, OK, fine, we'll use this other model. Um, so I don't know. So let's um, go to the audience for some questions. You guys have a burning question for the panelists. Um, do we have a microphone? It's right behind. Someone hand Sarah up that microphone. Hey, guys. Hello. OK, I have a question about um, finding customers. How do you go about finding early customers who are willing to try out a product that sucks right now or doesn't exist, right? Like at the very early stages of your company. I mean, Who's doing? B you're doing B two B. I'm being. I'm doing B two B, and you can't just go and knock on a you know chemicals manufacturing plant. They won't let you in. So um, relationships uh, are the best, right? So as much as it might seem. Again, this touches upon the kind of soft side of, of things. Networking is huge. Um, going to events where you think your customers are going to be, um, talking to them, again, building those relationships will open doors. Um, so at least in the B2B world where kind of at least my customer segment is, seems completely inaccessible, uh, you can still kind of work the networking dynamic to form meaningful relationships, and then that will open up doors. So that's how we did it. Yeah, for B2C, I think the bar is high. So uh, you, customers really expect things to work really well. 
So the trick is not to build something super complex, just scope out something that you can build quickly and have a V1 of, even if it doesn't have all the features, and launch that. And then get, get your product out there as fast as possible. I think people want to spend a long time trying to get the best thing. So you know, there are product pipelines. Like you know, The thing that we have right now that's live, if you were to use our service, it's not something that we came up with like years ago. This is something that evolved, right? And the V1 of something is completely different from the V5 or 6 of it. So that, that's just how you evolve. And that's like the funding rounds help you get there as well. Engaging some of you, if you're in a case that you have B2B and they're hard to like, you can't just go find them and just talk to them uh, routinely. You can engage them as advisors. They might not be willing to buy your product today, but they might be willing to tell you what you can do to, I mean, if they see the elements are there and you're just missing the, you know, uh, some 5% details that will make your product uh, what they want, they, they would be willing to advise you. Please. Do you have a clever techniques that you guys use for getting built to reality? Like the case being, when you don't know anything, you think like, oh, I have this great idea, I'm such an awesome guy, when you're super ignorant. And then as you know a lot about your subject matter, you think everybody kind of knows that, and this is not very innovative and who cares. Like, how do you gauge that reality, get to the reality points and be like, all right, it's time to build something, it's time to launch this idea, this is reasonable. How do you know the time is right to launch your idea? Or yeah, or just that you have an innovation. Like, if you're surrounding yourself with other, like in your PhD program, you're surrounded by other people that know the same stuff you, how do you always test that, really? Like, I mean, you can't just go to the arts program and go, like, hey, does this make sense to you? Do you pay much money? It's probably the same. It's, an, it's a version of the same question that was asked. How do you find your first customers, right? Because I think the point is you have to start hallway testing, um, whether you're hallway testing on LinkedIn or you know, talking to your friends who work at companies. But I think ultimately you want to find the point where somebody lights up about your idea, your solution to their problem. First of all, they understand what the hell you're talking about when you say, do you have this problem? They're like, yes, I have that problem. Because people know they have the pain. And then the second most valuable thing is when your solution actually represents something they haven't already tried to solve their own pain, then you know you're onto something. But at least in my experience from a B2B perspective, it just takes a lot of conversations to untrick yourself from thinking that you have an idea that represents a pain that someone else wants solved. Because you're the most optimistic person as the entrepreneur, and you have to, you have to untrick yourself by talking to lots of people who actually have the same problem and are actually open to trying your solution. And it's a process, but it, takes, it, it comes with practice, at least in my experience. I don't know if you guys would agree. I agree, I agree. I think one thing to add there is that you, know, you can't extrapolate from you know, one data point, but you can draw a line between two. So the more you kind of train yourself to pattern, you know, do pattern recognition of, I talk to you know, five customers, all five of them seem to have this other pain point that seems relevant to what I thought their pain point was, but slightly different, but they're all talking about this other thing, right? So then you need to qualify that. Do they actually know what they're talking about? Are they just following some you know, hype or some buzzwords, or is this actually a pain point? So you start qualifying that. And, you know, it comes down to a gut feeling at the very earliest stage. I think you can quantify things a little bit better once you have some momentum and you have some expertise in the space. But if you're talking about launching, right, that needs to, uh, you will never have sufficient evidence to do that in a very, like, comfortable way, I would say. And maybe one thing to be careful, a lot of people will tell you this is an amazing product and this is great. And uh, until somebody hasn't paid you the money or hasn't done the, basically the part that makes them your customer, uh, that doesn't mean much. Uh, s there are ways to improve on your surveys uh, to just get a better gauge, but the best way is to, uh, you know, it's, it's every time it's just a, a lot of stress to know, like, will people get to buy this, will people like this, and that drives you to improve every day and every, on every feedback you get. So it's just part of the process. You, you're never sure. And even when the first person buys it, you're like, well, would the second person buy it? Is it, is it gonna keep continuing? So uh, it's, I think it's a process to just be in it and improve and just uh, grow. Yeah, so I guess everyone here uh, is familiar with data science, so I can use this analogy. Um, everyone knows the great the centers, right? So I hope it's not Crazy idea. Imagine you have a valley, right, and you try to get to the bottom of that, and you're going to sample 
Uh, you're going to take a little bit of data samples, you're going to get to the bottom. I think your, the answer to your question is exactly that. How do you know you're right? You don't. You literally start it somewhere in that valley, and you want to get to the bottom of that. And to optimize, that's literally the whole process of building the startup. You're going to take a month or a few people, sample some data, figure out what direction you should move to next, and pivot your product until you get to that valley. And you're basically gradient descending through the startup. And that's how I think, like, I think about it at least. So maybe I have a great hypothesis and a great prior to start me somewhere, but until I validate it with people and I move based on their feedback and continue doing that process, I'm not going to actually get to the, the product market fit, which is like the crucial point in the startup. I think the biggest challenge there too for us engineers is you just want to go out and start building something. And you can do that. It's going to take a lot of time. And it's going to take you a lot longer to figure out if you built the right thing when you finally emerge from your coding cave and you show the proposed client that thing. It's amazingly easy to test ideas with a landing page and a presentation deck. And it's not our strong skills as engineers necessarily to be a communicator like that, but it's amazing how many coding cycles you can save if you would just put pen on paper and learn to communicate it's going to teach you a few sales skills, a few communication skills, but if you can get someone to buy into the problem and the solution that you've articulated in a two-page PowerPoint, um, you're going to save yourself blood, sweat, tears, and a lot of cash from your bank account by not going out and building it first. Now, sometimes that doesn't work. We want to just build stuff and get out there. We're engineers, and that can work too, but you just have to realize that there's lots of shortcuts to validating your ideas that don't involve coding, and that's a hard thing to learn as an engineer. It's also scary because you're going to get rejected a ton. People are going to say no, and I think that's why people don't want to do that. And I think to your point about monetization, try to monetize as soon as you can because that's also when people are going to start saying no to you. So I think hindsight, we waited too long to do that, right? Like we should have started a long time ago, but um, as soon as you start really trying to get people to pay for your product, that's where rubber hits the road and that's where you're going to know you have a business or not. So just get to it as quickly as possible. Um, and it's also very easy these days, right? You can put up a website quickly and you can imagine you have the product build a website you can always say well we are uh, testing or like we disclose it that you, it's not product is not ready but you can put the concept out there with really uh, next to nothing mm -hmm. just your time and put, putting the text yep. and slides together agreed uh, one more one more question then we'll when we'll break here uh, this is more for the founder and you guys. Uh, what do you think of work-life balance and if it exists? Or what are your thoughts and how do you maintain yourself and your work-life balance personally? Uh, I'll take this question, I think, first. Yeah, so um, I have very strong opinions about this. Uh, there is a book called Rework, written by the two founders of uh, a software company that you might know. They produce this, uh, a piece of software called Basecamp, and they kind of give anti-advice to this workaholic American kind of culture of working 100 hours a week and whatnot. So, um, like, I kick people out of my office at 6 p.m. Um, we want to hire people who have interesting, exciting lives outside of work because then they don't waste their time um, at work. So, I mean, I'm two and a half years into this startup and I don't think I've pulled more than one or two, you know, 50 plus hour weeks. So it can be done. It's just a matter of, you know, discipline and culture. So I, are those your employees? <laughs> future employees. So yeah, I, I, um, I'm going to have to go the opposite way on that one. <laughs> um, I think if you want work-life balance, then go retire at Google or Facebook. <laughs> like, that's what I told people when, they were, you know, when I was hiring and everything else. It's like, if you, if you want to live a pretty nice life and just chill and do that, then go work at a company. To me, that's like retirement. <laughs> if you want to be a founder, and your employees can take their time, and your employees should not be burnt out. But as a founder, if you're about to give up a, a job that's paying a ton of money to do something, you better make it work out <laughs> because everything's on the line for you. So, you know, I, I personally try to balance. I do take some time off and everything, but I will say that if you're not working hard, someone else is working hard, and they're trying to get to do what you're doing. Um, so, but you, as a manager as, and as a founder, you have to keep your team from burning out. So you have to put limitations on them as well, um, if that makes sense. But you don't get that luxury. <laughs> awesome, hot button. Um, that was a great one to end on. We're going to carry this into the happy hour. Um, thank you guys for the amazing opinions and, and even more the experience. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.